Well, thanks very much. I just want to introduce our panel um, first. Next to me is Xavier, sorry, Xavier Duvel, who's the Vice <coughs> Prime Minister of uh, Mauritius, previously the Finance Minister, and he won African still, Finance... Still the Finance Minister. And still the Finance Minister. <laughs> One African Finance Minister so. of the Year, sorry. I, I think so. Um, Touch wood. <laughs> hopefully. Um, and next up we have Rich Lesser, who's the CEO of Boston Consulting. And Wale Tanubu, who's the CEO of Oando. And then we have Tabitha Karanja, who's the CEO of Karachi Breweries. And over there on the far end is <laughs> Anand Singh, who's a producer, Oscar nominee. And we're going to be talking about can Africa tap into local innovation to launch globally recognized brands. So it's, is there a point of doing this? Do we want to go global? And is, is it necessary? And I think just to take a step back, it's worth, it's worth thinking that here in South Africa, we have one of the most globally recognizable brands, a very valuable brand, uh, potentially, a brand so valuable that it inspires pride and love and respect, and it's a brand that is recognizable from Beijing to Bo Buenos Aires to Bloemfontein. And it's a brand built on consistency, on principles, a brand that has fundamentally changed the landscape of this country and fundamentally changed the lives of not just every South African, but many people around the world. Now, what is that brand? Nelson Mandela. So, you know, he, he is many things to many people, but he is one of the most powerful, lucrative, recognizable brands in the world. Anand Singh has just produced a movie on him, Long Walk to Freedom. And it's taken you 20 years, more than 20 years, to get a movie about potentially the most famous brand in the world onto the screens. Why did it take so long and what were the real challenges in telling a story about a man who simply is quite fantastic to many people? You know, um, I think certainly the idea that Mandela is a brand and an African and South African brand, it's probably the, the most significant brand on the, in the world. You know, you think of Coca-Cola, you think of Mandela, and what Mandela represents and the values that he uh, represents um, that the world has embraced. So, you know, it's been um, a fantastic honor to... Uh, to be granted those rights and to, acquire, to make a film of it, but with it comes responsibility. So the function of making Long Walk to Freedom into a film has had many challenges. It's an amazing life, and you're trying to encompass it into a two and a half hour film, which in itself is a mammoth task. So you know, that 20 year period um, was very much introspecting, going into the book, going into his life, talking to people close to him, and trying to tell his story in a true, honest way um, so that people identify his weaknesses and his strengths and what made him become that brand, how he stayed to his values. So, you know, I think when I was granted the rights, I thought, well, maybe in, a, in five years I'll make the film. But when I think back to his journey and sitting in, in, in prison in Robben Island for 27 years, and, you know, I feel that the responsibility that comes with trying to make that film and do it as an African product. We had 12,000 people working on the film through the period. There are probably 20 foreign people on it. So, you know, we needed to create something that is inherently African, that we as Africans can own, but at the same time be able to take it to the world and stake our claim, which comes back to the first point you made about global and, you know, we want to try and be global, but coming out of Africa, emanating from here. And I think that's the key, because when I looked at the sort of theme of this, I thought, well, is global necessary? Isn't it good just to be regional or even really good in your own backyard? And I think it's a, it's a question I know that outside looking in, Rich Lesser has got an opinion on. I mean, what is, what is your assessment of innovation, particularly African innovation or products or brands, and the need to make them world recognizable? So I think I would start by saying there's just enormous opportunity here in Africa to build over years and decades to come. That we look at consumer spending in, in, that's going to go from a little over $600 billion to over a trillion dollars over an, a relatively short period of time. And that there's an enormous amount of untapped opportunity and aspirations among consumers and businesses here in Africa. And so 
we would say that the first priority is about building strong, robust businesses here in Africa. That historically, for too long, Africa was viewed almost with a trading post mindset, that you take resources out and you send finished products back in. And what we really want to achieve is Africa as an ecosystem. Africa where it's not just about the resources, it's about investing to build manufacturing infrastructure, strong brands, um, a high quality educated workforce, and to really create robust businesses. And that, that will take time and effort. And when you look at China or other places, you see that it started by building strong businesses there, and then over time taking them to the rest of the world. And I think the key to that is is Africans themselves. They've got to be able to say, listen, this brand is African and it's not substandard. Or, you know, I'd, I'd rather, rather buy an international whatever because I think it's better quality or I trust it more, I know it more. I know from a beer point of view, you've set up your own brewery and you're selling Kenyan beer to the area around Nairobi. But you know, you've, got to, you've got to trust the Kenyan consumer to say, listen, I would rather buy homemade you know, local Kenyan beer than you know, Budweiser because I think it's, I think it's better. How, how, do you, how do you ensure the consumer, the African consumer, supports the idea of an African brand? OK. Um, yes. When we talk of get, getting into the manufacturing, and starting brands that uh, will go Africa and the global market. We mean, anytime we are introducing a brand, we must make sure that it meets the international standard. Because even if you don't, the other brands that will be coming in to your local market, if it's Kenya, if it is Africa, that are international, and they will come to compete with you. So every time you're making a brand, we must make sure that you, introduce, you produce a brand that even is better than what you expect that will be coming in from other parts of the world. And that's what we did with the, our beer. We made sure that our beer is naturally brewed, better than what was there after breaking that 80-year monopoly that was already there. Making it better, but it just, doesn't, it just needs to be good. Does it just need to be consistent? Wale Tanubu, what, yes. I mean, what's your experience yeah. in terms of creating your own empire in West Africa when it comes to uh, oil and gas. But I mean, it's, it's, it's been a tough road, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, it, it was tough, but I think the, one of the first things we decided early on in, in building the business was that we wanted to think local, but act global. We wanted to create a business which had global standards in all we did, down to something as simple as our business cards, or our presentations, or the letters we wrote, or the service offering we gave to people. And um, it was a mentality which we drove right through the company, um, even down to our environment. I mean, I, I mean, I'll crack a little joke. Somebody said to me that whenever they're stuck in traffic and they're looking for a place to go to the toilet, they go to an Orlando station or Orlando, uh, an Orlando location. You know, in Africa, you don't really find a lot of public toilets around there because he knows it's going to be clean. And that was a mentality we drove right through the company. And we've been able to take that brand and utilize it in driving the business in terms of our quality, our safety, our operations, and duplicate that in every business which we've gone across. And uh, I think that what I actually look forward to seeing is the continent brand itself as, as a place for, for investment, a place for good returns, a, a place for good corporate practice, mm -hmm. such that we can at least get that soft barrier broken and we can actually start to trade within ourselves as a... As, as one trading group, you know, build local brands, and then face the international community. Because we do need to be good at what we do locally first before we can drive those brands um, externally. Absolutely. I want to talk about this a little bit later, but before we, before we get there, Mauritius, in a way, has become the poster child of a place you know, to ease the ease of doing business. It's a regional economic hub when it comes to South African companies trying to set up businesses. You, in a way, have very, very blatantly rebranded yourself away from being just a high-end tourist destination. How did you do it, and what was the real key in terms of trying to change the narrative? Yes, I think a country's brand is, in fact, uh, what it lives, you know, what is the reality. It's not just hiring a PR it, company it, exactly. and saying, listen, we've got a strategy. As they say, it's not what people say about you. It's, it's, you know, it's not what you say about yourself, it's what people say about you. So we've actually diversified the economy considerably. And over the years, uh, We've actually been consistent in what we're doing, consistent in, in, in achieving political stability, consistent in, 
in the rule of law, in a low crime rate, consistent in educating our people, consistent, as you mentioned, in easing uh, the, the, the cost of doing business in Mauritius. And now with diversification away from sugar, which was our main crop at, the, at, uh, at uh, independence, now into tourism, textiles, and now into high end, like education, medical services, financial services, BPO, etc. We see that Mauritius is expanding, and of course, the truth is always, is always coming out, and people realize that Mauritius is making an effort. And I was very pleased to see, in fact, recently that in the country brand index uh, published by Future Brands, Mauritius gained two places and is now in the top 20 in of the, the brands in the world, exactly. I had, I, first in Africa and ahead of many, many large countries. In many ways, one of your benefits is that you're small, you're an island. You know, Nigeria is large and unwieldy. You know, how, how more difficult is it to be able, you know, you can be small, you can start off small, but it's about scale in many ways. Uh, you know, you can brand yourself, but it's harder the bigger and more unwieldy it gets. I mean, give me some sense in terms of making something bigger brings its own sense of problems. And are there any lessons any of you can offer our audience and how you manage that in terms of upscaling? I think just le leading on from the points you mentioned, I think branding is not really about hiring a consultant to say this is what you should be. Your brand really is what you are, right? Now, so if, you're, if, if, if you made the point about Nigeria being large and unwieldy, yes it is, but what is interesting about Nigeria is that you have centers of excellence in everything. So if it's the telecoms market, for example, the 100 million lines there, first class companies have developed, and interestingly enough, African brands, you know, MTN is African, Glow is an African brand, all offering world class services. Airtel before was V-Mobile, was an African brand with a Zimbabwean technical partner. And all the services were, were, were the international quality, and, and, and those centers of excellence have been built up in different areas. For example, we've, got very large, we've gone from 2 million tons of cement production to 20 million tons by indigenous entrepreneurs mm -hmm. offering world-class services with world-class standards, first-class plants, okay, built with the latest technology. So effectively, what, what you see is a, a very large, to a certain extent, a wealthy country with excellent centers of, of, of centers of excellence which are gradually being duplicated and converging and aligning a nation in a new direction. And I think that's what is clear. And that's effectively what Nigeria is increasingly beginning to stand for today. We, we've talked a lot over the years. And um, in many ways, one of your big bugbears uh, in terms of sort of kick-starting African innovation or small African brands to make them bigger or better is, is the issue of capital. Um, you're a little bit more hopeful, you're a little bit more excited about the amount of money coming in to actually allow this to happen. I don't know if you want to say anything, Rich, about, and, 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 and Ant as well, about perhaps this outside looking in perception. Is it just about people thinking, oh, the narrative's different, this, you know, I'm hearing better stories about Africa. Do you think it's based on real, a real appetite? So, okay, I'd just like to start just to build on one point mm -hmm. that you had just said, which is, there's this tendency to decouple the brand from the offering, and they're inextricably linked. And the offering becomes the brand. When the offering is built on high service and product quality, when it's built on uh, talent and people, then that can be the starting point for defining the brand. And I think what we're seeing now is innovation and companies and more of a spirit of entrepreneurialism that's starting to emerge across Africa that in part is because of the progress on the governance front which is not all the way there, but boy, there's been enormous progress over years to create more rule of law, more stability, and more opportunity. And now you see businesses starting to form. And so and we look at a company like M-Pesa, which is started by Safaricom, which offers mobile banking in Kenya and now starting to take it elsewhere. I mean, it's creative, it's entrepreneurial, it's a real service advantage, and then that defines the brand. And there is capital, but there's frankly more capital in the world than there are investment opportunities. And so the challenge is to create an environment where investors who see the growth potential, who see the potential uh, to, to be a part of a growing, vibrant economy, feel comfortable with the risk end of the equation to want to invest around mm -hmm. businesses. I think, uh, you know, certainly from a standpoint of our industry, what we've tried to do, and I think it's true to every industry, is over the last 20 years, tried to do quality work even if it's at a minuscule budget by global standards, you're establishing the quality, the capability of what you can do in this country or this continent. 
And then as you grow, so whether it was Sarafina or Yesterday, these little movies that we made that got attention, but you know, it never went to the half a billion dollar box office level. You just keep at it and you keep doing good quality product. You build a reputation. And with that reputation, now we have a film, which is Mandala, which is uh, telling a story which hopefully and hits into all of the boxes that you have to tick to go and compete with Iron Man 3, because that is, they're spending $250 million making the film. But you know what? Intrinsically, people want to hear stories and be moved by it. And that's what we, as Africans, have great stories. So how we tell that and how we put it out there and how we compete is also reputational. And I think that is something that exists with every business, you know, irrespective of uh, how, um, how it starts, when it starts, you have to just build on the blocks. When we talk about, you know, this potential and, you know, the, the possibilities and all of that, I mean, isn't there a sense of urgency, though? We can all agree, everyone here can agree there's potential. A billion people, new consumers. But isn't there a risk that this is potentially going to all not fulfill its potential? To, because a billion people perhaps are not as educated as they should be, that there is, there is a... There's a tendency to try and downplay the risk now, perhaps because it's not fashionable. Do you, do you, do you sort of, how do you balance that? If I, if I can intervene here, I say that I think what's happening in, in Africa is that we're seeing a number of role models taking the lead. And that's very important because once the role models succeed, then the rest of Africa, the rest of the populations in Africa, will require go other governments to do the same. So I think we're going to, in fact, going to see a snowboarding effect through reforms, bringing prosperity in some countries, and other countries being forced to follow. But there is a sense of urgency, isn't there? I know the IMF has just said, you know, if, if South Africa doesn't deal with growth rates and, and inequality, there's risk of instability. And that plays into the brand. It, it, it affects a country like South Africa. In the last year, violent strikes severely affect the image of a country, no matter how hard they try, or doing well. I think um, building a brand and economic development happens a block at a time. You can't uh, rush it. It has to happen. It has to be linked with education. It has to be linked with training. It has to be linked with development of infrastructure. It has to be linked with reforms in doing business, low corruption, etc. But I really believe that uh, growth in Africa is here to stay. I think that's the, that's the uh, in fact, global thinking nowadays. But um, obviously, countries need to get together to make it happen. We sometimes rely on trade with outside, you know, the rest of the world, whereas in Mauritius we believe that there's a huge potential in inter-African trade. And we're not really tapping it. We have infrastructure issues, but we're also cost of doing business issues. And these, uh, these do not cost a lot of money, but they require a lot of effort. And in Mauritius we've joined a group of five countries to, to try and accelerate the reform, because we think that the reforms are not going as fast as they should do. From your, just, to, sorry, just to bring in um, Tabitha, I mean, from your point of view, East Africa is being quite progressive in trying to create some sort of economic zone. You know, how, how important is that for you as you look forward in terms of expanding your, your beer company? But also, the, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, just trying to distribute in, 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 in Kenya has its own set of problems, never mind trying to cross the border. Um, for me, I believe that we can do it. We as Africans, we can do it. And we need to believe in ourselves that we can do it. We need to know that we have enough market out for the African continent. Whatever we will do, whatever we will put forward. But we need to the support from above the law. Let's say our leadership, the governance, must be set right. That any time anybody who wants to take a risk and invest in their own country, and build up brands that, can, that we meet in the international standard, that it has the support of uh, the, local the local government and the support as an African brand. Even as we are going through a lot of difficulties and all that, even to distribute in our country, in uh, the East uh, Africa, if we may say, we just need to understand that the market is there, and uh, we will get that enabling environment created by our government that we'll be able to take the risk and put up capital so that we can start these brands that will meet those international standards. And with my small starting, I've seen 
even uh, starting up a beer, breaking that monopoly that has been there for the last eight years. I can say the support I've gotten, I'm ready to move and even do the project. And you can see the banks are ready to do the financing and all that. So we just need to believe in ourselves. Then the world will open up for us and we'll be ready to move. I mean, how important is that, a sense of self-confidence? I mean, is it, is it an intangible ingredient to all of this? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it as simple as that? Well, I think it's certainly absolutely necessary to have self-confidence. But I think self-confidence comes from the realization that your product or service must really be of a global standard. Consistent, Consistent good, quality. good quality. And then the brand starts to speak for itself. And then the next thing you start to deal with is penetrating regional markets, like she said, we're enabling, we're enabling how, how have you managed to deal with that? Because the issue of breaking down barriers, whether they're physical in terms of crossing borders or whether they're on paper in terms of regulation and that, I mean, that over and over again seems to be the real impediment to, to all of this, really. Well, I, I think it's important to note that we, we need to stop looking at breaking barriers down as something which our governments ought to do for us. I mean, I, I figured that out in building the business very quickly, that half the time it hasn't been thought of by them, and you do, you do need to spend time in educating them as to the reason why things need to be done. So if we, if we wanted to break a government monopoly, for example, because we could offer a service, we would spend time educating the government, taking time through. We'd oftentimes have to draft the MOUs ourselves, explain what we're doing, and understand that, look, if we can cross the border here and ship these goods here, for example, we could make X amount of revenue for the state. This is what the state gets, and this is what we create, and this is the number of jobs we do, and oftentimes we succeed in, in, in doing it. So all of a sudden, regional trade now is a priority. Um, we've had projects like the West African Gas Pipeline done in the oil sector, where gas is taken from Nigeria into other countries, for example. We've been able to expand our business um, our service offering across the, across the board. Um, and as opposed to a situation where the continent used to wait for foreign investors to come into our continent to do it, now it's been done by a lot of indigenous players who've su succeeded in delivering quality goods and services in their own local environment and can now, are now confident enough to take those services next door. And I, I think it's also Sorry, I'll come to you now, you know, managing failure, managing risk, because you know, as in any business, you have to do things, be taking risks and how you do that vis-a-vis um, -vis whether it's beer or movies uh, you know, or a country. You've got to do things, try to be innovative in one way, but also manage it in a way that if it doesn't work, that you can reconstruct and keep going. So I think um, starting with your question about why the movie took 20 years, because it was very much that. It's, you know, one piece falls in, three pieces fall out, three pieces fall in, one piece falls out. And, and how you manage all of this, um, and likewise, if um, um, a big brewery company in Kenya is try it has monopolized the country's beer, you know, you tr logistics of getting delivery, and, you know, how do you get that, how do you do it? It's all the same thing. I do think we're in a transition period where there was a period of time where it was about just rebuilding underlying confidence and belief in Africa and its potential. And I think we're now on a transition to a real focus on how do we unlock the potential, particularly mm. the human potential mm. that exists here. And I would point to four elements. One is around infrastructure, connecting the continent, addressing some of the huge issues that exist in power, water, transportation, information technology. A second huge one is around education, getting get to, to really have the billion uh, member workforce that's coming along, feeling able to contribute. We have to continue to invest in education, and that will mean both traditional ways of education, but leveraging new technologies as well to be able to reach more people and, and, and give them access to the world. The, the third um, is around health and having de-risking for individuals and having a stronger health foundation. And then the fourth, frankly, is around empowering women. I mean, it's half the population, it, but, but if you look at literacy rates, education, other elements, there's a huge opportunity, an enormous opportunity by investing to help women be, achieve their potential and be able to contribute at the same level. And all sorts of research that says in doing that, it actually disproportionately contributes to both stability and economic growth. So the, getting those four elements 
is really the next step in unlocking the potential to have businesses feel confident to want to invest here and have entrepreneurs and others want to grow and, and, and create. We know that in a way. I mean, I think every African will, would agree with you and governments know that. The question is, why aren't they doing something about it quick enough or are yeah. you doing something quick enough and do you feel yes. like governments are on the right track and more importantly, yeah. it's so crucial, there's an urge, there's a sense of urgency that it ha those very basic things have to be done in the next yeah. 20, 30 years because this potential is never going to flip over into reality unless Yes. The talking stops and governments actually get their hands yes. dirty. And it is, is, is it government's responsibility? Yeah, absolutely. I think governments have a lot to do, in fact, to encourage their industries to obtain good brands, you know, to brand themselves. Because a, a country's brand invariably reflects on an industry operating within a country's borders. Just to interrupt, but it's also about, isn't it, the Mauritian Health Department it also has to create yeah. its own brand. Is that what you're saying? I mean, at every Absolutely. level, government Absolutely. needs let's, to perhaps rebrand yeah. itself. Let's take the fi our financial services and why, for instance, the Mauritius Commercial Bank is successful around, around the region. Because I think we, in Mauritius, we have created a well-regulated uh, financial services industry, which is based on law, which, is, which, is, uh, which, is, you know, which is, has a good reputation itself. Therefore, banks operating from Mauritius can, can enjoy that reputation. And the same, perhaps, for our tourism industry where you know, the environment of the country is conducive to uh, not only the development of a good hotel industry, but supports the fact that when you market yourself as a, as a high quality uh, uh, hotel, that is supported by the brand of the nation itself. So I think uh, g governments have got to do a lot, can do a lot to support uh, its export industries but, generally. But I think the question is, is that are governments capable of doing it? And at the same time, is there a responsibility on the private sector? I know, Wally, we've talked about it with leaders before, you know. Do you have to do what Tabitha did and literally sort of keep on poking your finger in the eye of the in monopoly? Is it, is it the responsibility of the private sector to, to really be tough and to break down these walls and help government in the way you say you've literally got to take them kicking and screaming, holding their hand? I mean, how, is there a moral responsibility to do that? Well, I, I mean, apart from or is it just fine? It's obviously financial. I mean, it's <laughs> apart from moral responsibility, there. it's just good business. Just, exactly. It. In the sense that we've come from, you know, a lot of the continent 30 years ago was involved in civil strife. There was military rule. There's been a lot of democracy. I mean, most of like I think 80, 90 percent of the continent is now uh, demo uh, democratized. Good governance has kicked in um, because as you had democracy, you had people recognizing a need to deliver to the promise. And there's been a lot of liberalization of the economy. So all of a sudden, you know, the, having a government position doesn't guarantee you access to resources like it used to because population explosion has, has occurred and the government simply cannot cope. So a lot of the liberalization has actually been driven by a government's realization that it needs to relax um, the restrictions on trade, but b also the private sector realizing that it needs to capture the moment okay, and expand its own service offering improve its quality. So we've had financial services groups springing across Africa, supporting small-scale industries, medium-scale industries, as well as large-scale industries. And we've seen um, an evolution of, of trade, particularly indigenously grown businesses, which, which operate at global standards and are able to you know, employ hundreds and thousands of people and create a, a better quality life for, for, for African citizens. Well, I, I think that it's a collaboration. Um, certainly from our industry, we've learned that Ten years ago, it was a minuscule industry in South Africa, um, and we had meetings with government, uh, talked about incentives that were available worldwide. Um, the Department of Trade and Industries then introduced an incentive program. The film industry has exponentially grown in the last ten years, from maybe a hundred um, hundred million rand a year industry to a almost 8 billion rand a year industry. And I think now Mauritius has introduced their um, uh, incentive program. These things take time to grow, but it was a collaboration between industry and government, and government has recognized that the biggest um, benefits that they have generated in, in programs that they've created in South Africa, the film industry is one of the most tangible. So, you know, which is really quite something uh, when you think back in a short period of 10 years that it's grown so well. So I think it is definitely on, the responsibility is on the private sector to work with government in trying to get to a place 
that we can build for the country and the continent. The issue, I know Wale discussed it, sort of pockets of excellence within Nigeria. I mean, when you, when you look 10, 20 years ahead in terms of the African continent as the world's workshop or the potential to be the world's workshop, is it again that sort of model of there going to be pockets of excellence and there is going to be this sort of perhaps disparity or this inequality of excellence? Well, movie, sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, any of you, I mean, this is yeah. sort of a general question. To I, I, I don't think so. I think the pockets of excellence multiply and you start moving in one direction. I mean, you're in the movie industry. Let's take the Nigerian movie It's exactly yeah. the point I was going to make. Yeah. Initially, it was young people with a home camera shooting videos with a lot of noise in the background and changing scenes behind them. The quality was very, very poor. Gradually, uh, it, it, the quality has improved substantially. The number of films being generated has improved. And now we see those same movies okay, across Africa because the sound quality is good, the picture quality, they're shooting on better quality locations. They even approach corporates like us to say, we will shoot a scene in your <laughs> petrol station and we want X amount of, uh, uh, we want X, you to pay X amount because it's advertising for you. These are the statistics showing that this movie will be shown in Kenya, in, 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 uh, in Ghana, in Uganda, in Tanzania. And, we, and I've traveled so, and turned the TV on in different parts of Africa and seen Nigerian movies on there. You know, and even, a local industry has come with them being able to create subtitles, albeit by pirates. They now put <laughs> French subtitles on, on Nigerian movies and they're selling it in Francophone West Africa. So it's really developed and, and the standards. And now we have our own version of the Oscars. We have our own stars and who are doing so well financially, who've actually become African brands. And with Mnet being there to distribute these movies, you know, all of a sudden, African movies, which were um, something which you shot in the corner, um, 10, 15 years ago are things that are of world-class recognition today. You touched but, on the issue of pirates, and I think for you, earlier on when we were chatting, that was one of the barriers you felt that in terms of getting your movies distributed in Africa. The, the issue of corruption, piracy, this even parallel informal industry can dilute the brand? Well, look, just adding on to the point of Nigerian cinema, I think there's, it's a matter of time that there'll be a great film coming out of whether it's commercial, whether it's artistically, um, uh, creatively. But it's one enough. Don't, doesn't, it, doesn't it need to be a whole lot every year? Yeah, exactly. You know, because it's, but you're building on, you know, that starting in a sort of back room making these soaps and then learning your craft and developing and continuing. And that's, it will happen. You know, you've seen it in other countries in the world. You've seen it in India. And then Slumdog Millionaire comes along. And then it, and it does enormous box office, a little film, um, with a heart-wrenching story. So it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. But I think the barriers, like piracy, is a, is a big problem. When I did Sarafina several years ago, I mean, I was shocked when I arrived in places in Africa to screen the film, and it's already on then video, um, you know, and we get no revenue on it. So, you know, I think when you make films and you look at regulation around the world, um, and copyright protection, it's basically stealing, you know, people don't think to go into a store and steal a carton of milk, but they'll be happy to go buy a pirate video off the guy on the street, which is essentially the same thing. You know, the, the creative community that put that together, they're being robbed. But we need to develop, and on, from a governmental level, that all of these things are done in a proper way. It'll develop a the cinema industry again, which is slowly happening, but there needs to be more action. I mean, even in China with piracy, you know, that's something that's being dealt with now because, you know, it's an enormous revenue stream, both for government of the country because of the taxes, because they've got, you know, each movie ticket sold, you get a, a piece of the action, the government does. So, you know, it's something that we have to ha get, ho get our hands around, talk to government, and we're doing that certainly from South Africa. Um, and I think on the products that are created in Nigeria, and they come here, at least, you know, those are being sold legitimately. We distribute some of the Nigerian films on, on, on DVD, and it's amazing how well they've grown over the last four or five years. But this issue of piracy and corruption in the greater scheme of things, I mean, for, for someone like you starting a business, trying to deal with the sort of the big monopolies and work within the Kenyan environment, I mean, did you, have, did you have trouble trying to make your way through any issues around corruption? And how important and how much of a barrier has that been to you? 
um, as I said from the beginning, uh, that belief. You know, the lack of that belief is what made us, somebody like us now, going through those problems. Because you're saying you want to make a beer, you have been having a beer for the last eight years, so who are you to tell us that you can make a beer because you're African? But the minute now we have that belief, you'll, uh, we won't have good people going those, through those problems. But it is true, we went through a lot of barriers, and that's what keeps on me every day believing that we Africans, we can do it. And we have that will. And all what we need is that neighboring environment so that we can do the business, that will enable us to do the business. And every time, in every part of the continent, we are talking of job creation. Every country is suffering from job creation. But the problem is, you wonder why is it that everybody is not understanding that all this can come through uh, creating uh, businesses that will create those, uh, those jobs. So meaning we need to encourage more Africans so that they can make more, more industries, they can risk, risk in their own continent, and after they create those employment, we'll start seeing even the poverty level going down. So going through these difficulties and all that, I believe is because even us, maybe our leaders and ourselves, we don't believe that we, we can do even better than what the multinationals can do. How key is the issue um, of transparency in terms of you as a country presenting your, your brand to the, to the world? I think, I think it's been very key, hasn't it? Absolutely. I think the question of honesty, transparency, good governance is essential to a country's reputation and to citizens as well. I mean, we all need to be proud of our country. And, and that, uh, that obviously, the more that we apply the rule of law and, uh, and transparency and, and, and et cetera, the better we feel and the, better, uh, we, the, the more we're able to attract foreign direct investment. We've seen in Mauritius that adopting a rules-based approach to uh, licensing of investments, for instance, does uh, bring certainty and does attract uh, investment to our country. Particularly outside looking in, I mean, I know, and particularly American com company, companies um, have often said to me, there's, there's still this fear, this sense that they're going to have to pay a bribe, and they can't, obviously. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act puts a whole other level on that. But that, that perception and perhaps the reality that this is a corrupt continent has, in a way, limited and broken down the African brand as a whole, never mind individual companies or individual countries. Look. The main challenge and the main opportunity is to continue to create an investment orientation. And some of that is companies that want to invest and feeling that there's stability and a rule of law that makes them confident to want to invest, to develop not just sales operations, but develop whole businesses here and put the capital in and invest the talent that's required to do that, and create an investment orientation inside the country where entrepreneurs and people with ideas and passion feel like that they, they can take a chance and they can do that, and there will be enough of a level playing field that if their ideas are powerful, that they can make it work. And then lastly, investing in people. And that's where you keep coming back to you know, health and education and infrastructure that really enable people to, to grow themselves personally and be a part of the global workforce. Because the competitiveness of the global workforce, you're coming earlier about you have to operate to a global standard. It's completely real. And so we need to develop the talent here that can compete not just with people in the neighborhood or in the same country, but, but around the world in order for it to be a workplace for the world. And that's, that's the opportunity. I mean, I think a lot of the things that we've been talking about, a lot of it is, is touchy-feely in a way. It's about confidence. It's about changing narratives. It's about a sense of telling your own story. I mean, we, we, we all know that. But do you think, from, again, from an outside looking in perspective, I mean, has that worked? How important is that, that perhaps Africa's story has changed in the last few years. I mean, is that, as, is that as important as trade barriers or visas being dropped? Perception always lags reality a bit, but the reality and the way international companies perceive Africa today is just so much different than five years ago or 10 years ago. I go around the world, I talk to clients, you talk to them about their priorities, and many of them now consider Africa one of the core areas of growth. And some of that, frankly, is the challenges in the rest of the world. Growth isn't so easy to find in other places. 
but some of it is I think people really feel like Africa, if it hasn't completely turned a corner, is really in the process of doing that. And well, there are so many, you know, people thrive off of stories, and that's true for individual entrepreneurs, but it's true for, for bigger businesses as well. And when they watch leading companies come in and build businesses and able to operate here and able to, to make it work, then they, then they see the potential and they, they want to do that as well. So I do think the narrative matters, but the narrative has really changed a lot. You know, this was the, a decade ago was the hopeless continent in The Economist. That's not the way anybody thinks about Africa right now, That's true. which doesn't mean it's, there aren't issues to work through. There are plenty. It's a big change. Well, I think it's certainly indicative of the summit. Uh, this is the largest attendance in 20 years of the Forum Summit in Africa. When you look at the list of people, not only African people, but from, America, from the United States, from Asia, from um, Europe, and its CEOs, you know, so it's very interesting to see that shift happening. So obviously, um, as uh, Rich indicates, the, you know, the potential and the other markets, and now, you know, whatever the challenges are, it, Africa is being, has been identified as a place to be in, investigate, get into business, you know, even if it's a sh one to two year period, one to five year period, whatever it is, let's go see for ourselves, which is the most important thing, I think. And, and this is only occurring because they're good case studies to talk about. Absolutely. So yes. Every time Absolutely. there's a success, it resonates across the continent, mm -hmm. it gets copied in different countries, and, and then people support it. I mean, we've seen us, I mean, in, in, the, in the developed world, the way I see it is that business is only going to be driven by innovation because they've got everything. So everybody has a house, everybody has a car, there's public transport. So you've got to be Apple and create version 5, version 6, version 7 every week to get an increased market share. In our markets, okay, you're satisfying um, demand that is pent up and has never ever been serviced. And I think the only thing that, the only, the only um, barrier is, is, is this is the right enabling environment to invest in. And every time we get it right, okay, it means even more business coming in. I mean, a classic example was the mobile phone explosion in Nigeria. We had 400,000 phones before government monopoly starved of capital. You had to wait five years for a line, and you were in a waiting queue. Even if you paid $5,000 then, you, you would wait three years to get a line. And then the government had the will, political will, to say we want to hold a transparent auction. They held a transparent auction, which was done on the internet. And everybody paid $20 million to qualify. And, then, and there were about 20 people who started the, the, the... I was involved in one consortium. We were called the Eaglets, because well, the Nigerian national team is called the Eaglets. And we were, we were about seven or eight people under the, age of, of, under the age of 35 who formed our consortium. We reached out. And we were able to bid because it was transparent. It was done on the internet. We won our license. Eventually, today, we have close to 100 million mobile phones in the country. There's $25 billion worth of investment. Okay? And it's an incredible success story in which foreign companies who didn't look at Africa as a growth market avoided. But local brands were created in the process. And now I see companies like Vodafone selling their mature markets and saying, we want to go to the emerging markets, we want to go to Africa, we want to go to Asia. Because that's the only way we see growth, because it's completely saturated in, 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 in the developed world. So I think with increased transparency, we will get, we get the, the, the right brand created, we will get the right message across. And no wonder that they're, they're coming here. So, the, I mean, the innovation that is there, the entrepreneurship is there, it's just, and the need is fueling it in a way. But the trick is how to convert that into bigger, sustainable, yeah. larger brands. Can, can, I say just, can I say just one thing, perhaps we, are, we also have to realize, is that the growth of the consumer markets in Africa will also bring a lot of competition, which will, in a way, threaten existing companies operating in Africa. So even though you may not wish to export, you'll have to get better just to stay in the game. We see that uh, uh, everywhere in terms of the, the uh, shopping, for instance. The local shops are being threatened by outside groups coming in. This is happening also in IT in different areas. So in a way, the whole uh, environment will change for companies because not only will they have opportunities to, to expand uh, regionally and globally maybe, but also they'll have to get much better just to survive in their own markets because all this FDI that we're going to attract will create additional competition for all of us. A absolutely, and, and to build on that, we've done a lot of research on African consumers, and one of the things we observe is 
They're very quality oriented. They are loyal to brands, but you have to get trial and you have to do it reflecting the challenges here. Lower income for many people, infrastructure challenges. And so the people that can innovate and develop quality, quality offerings um, and really differentiate and then get trial are going to be the ones that can win. And they're not just African companies. If you look at Indomie noodles in Nigeria, if you, if you, if you look at uh, Bajaj uh, motorcycles from India, you, uh, you see uh, companies that came in, um, invested to educate the consumer, invested to get trial, and then have built loyalty and, sh and share and have been able to, to really grow over time. And I think that story is good for the African consumer, right? They just want quality products at a price and they choice. can afford and choice. It's a good thing. It, it is an opportunity for African entrepreneurs, but it's an opportunity to compete at the global standard, where you were at the beginning, and it's completely true. Do you want to add into any, does anybody want to add to this? I'm going to open the floor if anybody wants to say something before I do that. Um, does anybody want to ask a question of any of our panelists? Hello, uh, my name is Atu. I'm uh, from the Accra Global Shippers Hub in Ghana. And I actually want to direct my question to Mr. Singh. Um, so, you know, I think you guys actually started talking about Nollywood and some of the different uh, movie industries. Um, so I wanted to kind of do a quick comparison. Um, so in West Africa, I see a lot of many, a lot of movies being created, you know, from Nollywood, um, the Ghanaian movie industry, um, from Ivory Coast, etc. And uh, I feel like there's a smaller percentage of really quality movies, like big budget movies. And in South Africa, I see a lot of big budget movies that are, you know, like winning Oscars, like Tootsie, some of the work that you've also done. Um, how can we get a balance between having to tell a lot of stories versus um, getting, you know, maybe a few stories that are, you know, that can really travel very far, do their film festival circuits, et cetera. So that's my first question. Now, the second question is, what has, how have you navigated some of the challenges around distributing your, um, your movies? Uh, because, for instance, you know, I would really love to watch a lot of South African movies. Um, but I always have to wait to come to South Africa before I buy them. So I just wanted you to touch on that. Okay. Look, um, certainly the budget and the scale of a film doesn't necessarily reflect, you know, how an audience will respond to it. The first movie I made was done for under $10,000 as a whole feature film, and I released it almost everywhere in the world, in movie theaters. And it was an anti-apartheid movie, being uh, on the run from the police. Now, you know, the little movie that we made that was nominated for an Oscar yesterday um, was, again, a movie that was made for three, four hundred thousand um, dollars. So it's first and foremost, it's about the story and how you tell the story. So, you know, this myth that you've got to have big budgets to make stories that will engage the world is, you know, really, in, in my experience, not, not true. Of course, you know, you can make a big movie, you get big stars, and may, you probably will do, be, do decent business, but it all, you know, it all adds up. It's coming back to the point of risk. But I think that as Africa and as a continent, what I would like to see is a collaboration between countries, like we have co-production treaties with France and Italy and Australia, um, you know, we should do more within our continent. Um, so a Nigerian-South African co-production and incentives from Nigeria, incentives from South Africa and create African product on a bigger and better scale and learn from each other. So certainly that, that, those are the two things. I think on the distribution side, that is a big challenge on, on our continent. That, you know, there aren't enough movie theaters. There aren't, um, you know, the, the whole machinery of getting films out there, um, whether it's movie theaters or DVD or television, you know, the restrictions that, it, that exist. And I think, again, coming back to the idea of having corporates being involved, you know, a sponsorship, being able for sponsors to say, I'm associated with this product, it's an African product, we're an African company, uh, let's try and make this uh, a, an experience that every person, no matter where you are in a little village or in, a, in an urban environment, that you can all share the same experience. Uh, but that is a, is a big challenge. And, and then 
taking our content and bringing it to the world is the next phase. But you do have, again, it comes back to quality. It comes back to the ability to have audiences and critics respond to the material. Because we have unique uh, environments, unique stories, great performances. Um, you know, we made a little movie in Kenya. Um, we used all local Kenyan cast. Um, and again, the f film won awards around the world, won prizes, because people want to know more about our continent. And if you tell it in a way that they are engaged, emotionally entertained, then you've, you've won half your battle. Good. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my question is actually to the Honorable uh, Vice Prime Minister from Mauritius. So I have two questions. Uh, my name is Barbara, by the way. I represent the Financial Times uh, Foreign Direct Investment Magazine. And so my first question is much more general. Um, there's a lot of this optimism um, in WEF. Uh, but one of the things that I can't help but question is, what's to say that this boom that Africa is going through isn't cyclical? <coughs> so yes. post-independence, 1960s, Africa went through a massive boom, and then it dipped. So that's the first question. How is, is this just another cyclical trend? And the second thing is, could you identify to me some of the bottlenecks and some of the risks within Mauritius doing business environment that prevents local businesses from innovating effectively and also growing? So could you also maybe talk about the risks okay. that you have identified? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't believe that it's a short-term uh, growth uh, cycle that we're seeing in Africa. I believe that it's not just a commodities boom and the prices are going up and then uh, uh, African countries are doing well. I think firstly the quantity that is being extracted is much more than before, firstly. And secondly, and importantly, this is all being now linked to a good governance. So we see reforms all over uh, the continent, which will uh, embed the, the growth. I think this is uh, happening also. And uh, as I think uh, previous speakers mentioned, uh, 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 it's, it's hard to find high returns around the world at the moment. So people are investing in Africa also because they, they, they see the higher returns. There are higher risks involved and that's where we see Mauritius coming in in a way because um, countries like Mauritius can also help by, uh, by uh, sort of going via Mauritius you can actually reduce some of the risks associated with, uh, uh, with uh, investing across the continent um, because of various factors. Um, in terms of uh, innovation in Mauritius itself, I think that was the question. Um, I think that traditionally we've been more of a manufacturing base. We've been, we haven't been able to generate the sort of research and development within our citizens itself that, that, that will uh, bring innovation. But we are now realizing it more and more. And in fact, for instance, taking the textile industry as, as an example, we were just uh, making you know, suits and shirts for everybody else. But we now set up a fashion and design institute. And we're seeing actually young people in Mauritius beginning to design clothes and, and, and local brands coming up and becoming regional, etc. So there is to be a real effort in terms of the government itself, fostering research and development, fostering innovation. And that has to be, uh, for a country like Mauritius, it, it will not grow, by, it will come by itself. It has to be fostered and, and encouraged by government. Great, I know you wanted to say something. Hi, um, Nishana YGL for this year. And the question of the panel is, the theme of this panel is made in Africa. And I'm wondering um, the panel's thoughts on how does Africa brand itself as different from other regions? So what is different and unique about Africa versus, let's say, Latin America or Europe or Asia? And what's unique about um, the Africa value proposition? Who would like to take that one? I, I would, I'll just, uh, I'll start. The, the, <laughs> the, the starting point first, of course, is Africa has assets that that in many ways give it an underpinning and a source of financial resources that can really help support more investment. In terms of natural resources, in terms of agriculture, where 60% of the world's uncultivated land sits here and, and really creates a foundation to be able to reinvest that should be very helpful for years and for, for decades to come. I think second, the workforce that's coming along will be the largest workforce in the world over the next 20 years. It's a little bit of a mischaracterization to describe it as a single workforce. The Africa is very diverse. There's hundreds of languages. There's, and so, so, but even then, there's a very large workforce that should stay relatively low cost 
for the rest of the world for a long time to come. But the challenge, of course, is then to differentiate beyond that. And that's where encouraging more entrepreneurial culture, taking advantage of some of the challenges that you know, lack of infrastructure creates in terms of sustainability, in terms of doing creative ideas, um, it's going to be quite important. And frankly, the quality of the workforce will ultimately matter as much as the quantity of the workforce. And that will require the investments in education and other elements. So, so the truth is there's a reason there's a much better starting point than there was a couple decades ago in terms of the stability and the confidence people have in the region. And there's, a, and there's an underpinning of the ability to invest financially in infrastructure, the way Angola has taken $40 billion and put it into building infrastructure that the natural resources and agriculture offer. Beyond that, that's the next challenge for African leaders is to not just go off of what's there naturally and the quantity but to invest in quality that will attract companies to want to be here. And that story is not yet written. Just to, well, just to add to that, um, I think the, the underlying point is that the continent is transforming, but it's also doing it responsibly. So I'll just give you some very, very basic examples. Um, this is boom time for the continent. And rather than hear stories of outrageous corruption, you're hearing about governments who are now balancing their budgets, paying off their national debt like Nigeria did, um, they pass laws like the Fiscal Responsibility Act, stopping them from spending. You know, it's very tough for an African government to actually limit its own ability to spend. But we did it in Nigeria, saying we wouldn't spend more than 3% over and above what we budgeted for. They created policies for savings within the country, created a compulsory pension scheme to create long-term capital available for businesses to, 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 to borrow. That long-term capital that has been kept has created um, um, the ability for people to get long-term funding to, to finance infrastructure projects. And all of a sudden, the private sector in Nigeria is actively financing infrastructure projects. The government is privatizing. It's pretty much privatized everything. The thing that we have left to do is the power sector. And there's already a power sector roadmap, which would see the country in the next 24 months sell all the generating companies and the distribution companies to the private sector. And it's an indigenous driven private sector. It's not something that is driven from the perspective of saying we're seeking foreign investors. Most of the consortiums are run, driven by local entrepreneurs who are seeking support from international financial partners. But the international financial partners are not coming in to do it on their own. They realize that to navigate the treacherous waters of doing business in Africa, you need a strong local partner, which ties them to the point she made regarding confidence and the ability of people to realize that, you know, as a continent, we have to first of all do it ourselves, right? and then be branded as a place where things you know, do get done. I mean, Ghana, for example, they've discovered oil. They, have a, they passed a law, I think it's called the Heritage Stabilization Fund, which compels them to save 30% of the newfound wealth for future generations. Now, I think that you know, the mere fact that we've done self-help solutions to our issues is really what it signals to the world that we, it's, it's a place that the growth cannot be reversed. I know you wanted to say something, sir. Um, just to add to that while the mic's getting over. Um, you I've know, got the mic, sorry. You know, the, uh, to add to that, you've got, look at India and China 20 years ago and the consumer power that Africa represents 10 to 20 years from now, which is an enormous potential to businesses all over the world. Yeah, my name is Henry Bicky, Esther Young. My issue, the point I want to talk on is on perception, the perception gap and on the branding, the impact that has on the branding of Africa. Uh, I think there's still, from, there's still a perception gap. You know, the difference between what people see and what people hear outside and what the reality is on the ground. And so recently, Ernst Young did a survey uh, what, on, the, on reviewing the issue of perception gap. What we found was that those who are already doing business in Africa are very positive about the attractiveness of Africa. In fact, they rated Africa as second to Asia. But those who are not doing business in Africa, who are not already in Africa, actually saw Africa as the most unattractive place to do business. And this is about perception. And how do they, get, how do they form this opinion? It's about media, it's about what they hear. What we find is that we, the, the international media focus more on negatives about Africa rather than the positive. So my question is, how, what is the role of media in changing the perception of Africa and actually improving the branding of Africa? 
I mean, I'll, I'll jump in there. I mean, I think 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you could have argued that point. But I mean, uh, you know, I work for CNN, and I think the African story is, is, is pushing a lot of CNN's coverage. I mean, from a business point of view and from a news point of view, I present a program called Marketplace Africa, each week telling African business stories to a global audience. You know, that wasn't five years ago. I mean, that, that wasn't a story that was being told, and it's an incredibly popular show. And I think, three, I think from CNN's point of view, there's a responsibility from us, from the media, to also tell the real story, you know, warts and all. And I think there is a, there is, that's why I was so interested in the narrative, because the narrative is so powerful. And I don't know whether you, I mean, we all, we all sit here and agree that the value of what is made in Africa is, it does come from perception. Yes. I think I would dispute the fact there is only bad news coming out of Africa. I think there's a lot of good news. And in fact, in some countries, perception, in fact, has gone beyond uh, beyond reality, and you would expect things to be better than they actually are because there's such a lot of good news coming out of Africa. I think, uh, no, I, I don't think that... Uh, in fact, bad news travels fast, we all know that, and good news is no news at all. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think there's a lot of good news, uh, which is probably uh, dominating the bad news coming out. There's a lady at the I've back there. I know you, sorry. Go sorry, my mic is... Okay, they've switched it on now. Hi, my name is Dr. Ola. I run an air ambulance company and I'm YGL 2013. And my question is actually um, directed to Mrs. Tabitha. I just wanted to um, ask, um, I think diversity is very important in business. I think the more personalities, the more creativity, the more different skills you can bring into a business setting, the better the business. But I also believe in Africa, our attitudes to women in business lags behind um, the developed world. So my question to you is, did you face any unique challenges um, that you thought perhaps when you were setting up your business that were, you think that you experienced because you're a woman? And also, um, since we're focusing on made in Africa, um, do you, how do you see us creating these global international brands when we seem to be leaving 50% of the population behind? Maybe, maybe I can say, because of the type of the business I started, it didn't matter whether it was a man or a woman. So I can't say that what I faced or what I went through was because I was a woman. Because it was a competition, a war, and uh, it was a monopoly that was there for 80 years, and it was, uh, people had to protect. So it didn't matter whether it's a woman, or a man. But I can say, uh, the second question is about the African. Women in business. Okay. The attitude on women uh, to business, I can say in Africa, we all know that uh, women are taken like the second person in anything that, we do. anything that we do, whether it is any type of leadership, is it in politics, is it in business, whatever. But what we've tried to do now, me being an example, we are trying to show that even we women, we can even do better than what men can do. And I think it has been proven. We have so many now women in Africa who are proving that. We only need now us as women maybe to work a little bit harder and prove the world that we can do better than women, than men. Not only in Africa, actually, even in the developed world, but we've done it, and we, just, we can also do it. And I think we have started doing it. Thank can you. I, Sorry, I think for our industry um, in South Africa, the film industry is, if not dominated by women, it's actually mm -hmm. quite uh, significant, maybe equal or slightly, um, you know, variant from there. Can we take more questions, uh, or how do we have to wrap up with Maxwell? Okay. Sorry, start wrapping up. Yes. One more. OK, one more question, if that's OK. Who can I go for? We'll go for. Well, I wanted to follow up. Sorry, my name is Vuya Matlat, <laughs> African Financial Group. On the, on the film, you know, the, the issue of branding and the message. I think, you know, and I just want a quick comment from you and having, I mean, you know, you're not in film, but maybe 
from the Nollywood experience you were referring to earlier. How do we shift? Because you know, the, some of the movies that are making it are still promoting the victim, you know, issues of HIV AIDS, and, which is fine because we're showing how we're dealing with some of, of this. But how do we begin to shift this, I mean, use film as part of the branding into messages that present beyond, you know, just the struggle and the victim issues around some of the big challenges that we're experiencing to begin to present a new hope story that is linked to that? Because I'm, I'm becoming worried with some of the the films that are doing well, which are very good. But on the other hand, you listen to the message and just believe that we're continuing to perpetuate the stereotypes. Look, um, certainly from my standpoint, I agree with the point you're making. So the films that we've made, whether it was the HIV AIDS uh, story called Yesterday, which was an uplifting story, but very emotional in the journey of a woman who gets inflicted. Uh, and the stigma that comes with it. Um, but, uh, you know, the film I made in Kenya about an 84-year-old man who, a uh, former Mao Mao soldier who goes to school to grade one to learn to read at 84. Um, so, you know, you try to make stories that appeal to me as an individual or to any other producer or director. But we cannot prescribe to people, go make your movies, go do this, do that. You know, creativity is in the eye of the beholder. And if they want to make an action movie, if they want to be violent, I think the responsibility comes with public broadcasters when they put out um, a, a soap series every day and these issues are steered away from because they're afraid, that's a big mistake. These are issues that affect the lives of everybody every day and they should tell it in a real form. But, you know, broadcasters are afraid. So, you know, that, it's a very big dilemma because, you know, nobody can come and tell me, well, you should make this movie. You want to make it? You go make it. You pay, pay for it. You do what you want. But at the end of the day, as an individual, you assess your own responsibility, your own morality, and your own ethics, and you go do what you feel you should be doing. So it's a very difficult one. I think to interrupt, I mean, in a way, you bring up a good point, is that in branding your country or branding your company, as world class or quality or, you know, do you have to be honest about all the negative stuff? I mean, that has to be very much perhaps part of the brand. You've got to be sincere and true to yourself in that way if the brand is going to be honest. So, you know, there, there are issues, there are challenges, there are faults here. And, you know, do you include that as part of the story? I think transparency in today's world is at such a premium. It is so different than it was even t with social media and all the things out there that to think that you can hide issues and people won't notice, it's, it's not the world we live in right now. And it is far better to be direct, obviously, to portray in a positive light the steps that are being taken to address things, but to try to instill quality wherever you can and be transparent, it's, it's, it is the world we live in and it's critical. Absolutely. I think uh, for, for a brand to be sustainable, you have to, to be based on the truth. You don't have to necessarily to tell all the truth, but what you say is it has to be truthful. It has to be something that people will experience when they actually come to your country. And, and without a doubt, the brand would really and truly reflect what the product, service, or ethos is. So, I mean, the point was raised about are we leaving women behind in Africa? Um, if we take somewhere like Nigeria and the public sector, um, at least 35% of the, of the ministers are women form the, the, the cabinet. I mean, the coordinating minister for the economy is female, the minister of housing is female, the minister of petroleum is female, the minister of finance is female. So effectively, the key powerful parts of the economy are driven. So when we want to brand Nigeria from that perspective, is, is it a gender sensitive country? It has actually proven it in its actions. And, and, and there's, no, there's no doubt in terms of saying what they represent in society, because the reality is this, and that truly is our, is our brand today. Okay, I think I'm going to start wrapping up. Um, I just want to ask our panelists, sorry, we get, I'm getting the, the TikTok signal. Um, you know, when we talk about made in Africa, is there one word that each of you can, can give me about what you think defines made in Africa, and, and how important is that? And is it 
something you can put into one word. So if you're going to sew a label on the back of my shirt saying made in Africa, what is the, what is the description perhaps underneath? Originality. It? Originality. Made in Africa. I say the same, originality and Confidence, original. I mean, I think you, for you, confidence, yeah, know, confidence seems to be the Yeah, thing. we create confidence to African uh, people, to, Afri to the world, that we can also do it. We can also do it, and we've made it. Wale? I'd say success in a challenging environment. <laughs> 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 One word. One word. Well, it certainly will be success. Okay, okay. got you. Opportunity. I think I would say diversity. Africa has 54 countries, so it's not China. We will, there will always be differences around Africa. Okay. We shouldn't look for one word, one thing for Africa. So that's it. I mean, diversity, opportunity, success, confidence, and originality. Does that make Made in Africa a label that we want to buy into and that Africans want to buy into? And I think that's, that's the key for everybody doing business on the what, continent. What's your one word? <laughs> Exciting. Exciting. That's good. That's good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.